hopefully it's not just you and me and someone, some others will come and join us. <laughs> some of the information in chapter 16 and then Friday will be the review session for the exam next week um, can't remember what day it is it's on the syllabus and if you can't make that day make sure to let me know ahead of time um, or if you've got like three exams on one day please don't do that that's not beneficial to anybody I'd rather you took my exam a different day and had time to do it properly. All right, so um, just let me know if if you need to move that day, whatever day it is on the syllabus. Um, so chapter 16 has lots of information about different populations. Um, what I've tried to do is pick some of the ones that I think you're most likely to come across. Um, if you are teaching or coaching or personal training or any of those working in a rec center, uh, any of those kinds of jobs, or if you get a job um, running a gym for a private company, anything like that. Other than the women, um, so I haven't done uh, the women, um, most of the women's information is surrounding uh, eating disorders and osteoporosis and the female athlete triad. Um, they don't have a lot on the differences between women and men and uh, adaptation. Um, Children, I've not covered. The elderly, so the older adults, I haven't covered. So I want you to ignore those. Ignore women, ignore children, ignore older adults. Ignore HIV. Um, thankfully, uh, although it is still a problem, it's less of a problem, so hopefully you won't have to come across that. Um, Epilepsy, again, you could, you could have an epileptic um, in your class or in your team, but unlikely. I mean, it's a, quite a small population. Um, and then low back pain and cognitive disorders. We just don't have time to cover everything in that chapter. Um, and I think there's too many different pieces of information to make it a fair chapter to examine across the whole thing. So just focus on the ones that we hit in class, okay? All right, so we are going to start with asthma, um, which is rife especially if you're around here. I don't know whether it's because of the spraying of the crops or the cotton or combination or the dust, um, but there seem to be a lot of people who, who have um, asthmatic type symptoms around here. So um, for those of us that don't have asthma, it's um, where you get, it's really difficult to breathe. So it's a bit like an overblown allergy reaction. Um, you might get some wheezing and um, what happens is that the muscles around the uh, trachea and the bronchioles into the lungs get contracted um, and that makes the airway narrower and then that makes it harder for airflow. We talked about airflow um, earlier on in the semester. So it's often triggered by allergens that cause some kind of inflammation um, and, and this contraction. 
So other possible factors can be um, obesity, um, although there are plenty of people who are in good shape and exercise regularly who still develop asthma. Um, a lot of children have it, but now you, you also see uh, adult onset asthma. So um, it doesn't have to be obesity and a decrease in physical activity, but those um, are certainly risk factors. Um, we've seen a rise uh, in asthma in the past 30 years um, being diagnosed, and we've also seen a rise in obesity and decreased physical activity. So the, the research suggests that there's maybe um, some link some link there because if you're obese and if you are sedentary, then both of those things also reduce the diameter of the airway. Um, so that's kind of a, um, a backdoor in sort of thing. Um, when I was younger, like younger, school age, um, certainly uh, children at school who were asthmatic were told not to exercise. So that was the standard way, way, way back in the dark ages, um, was that you, you didn't exercise because then you'd have trouble breathing and you'd have an attack. And, and, um, but nowadays, it's very much encouraged for asthmatics, even though for some of them it is a trigger. Um, because it improves outcomes in other areas and it decreases the ventilatory load if you're active over time, right? So if you're consistently being physically active, then it, it helps quite a lot. There are specific recommendations. Um, so about two to four days a week at your ventilatory threshold which for most people is around 60% of their VO2. Remember that ventilatory threshold um, is a guideline for lactate threshold, so we're thinking about where's that corner there, um, for about 20 to 30 minutes. So they are, the guidelines are slightly different than the guidelines that we had on our FIT chart, which said, from 20 minutes to 60 minutes, all right? That's considered probably too much work for someone with asthma. <clears throat> um, resistance training and flexibility, the guideline is the same. So the only guideline on our FIT matrix that's different for asthmatics is the cardio. <clears throat> So exercise-induced asthma um, is obviously triggered by exercise, but you don't have to have been diagnosed with asthma to have an EIA attack, okay? They can happen to someone who typically does not suffer with asthma. Um, so it's worth understanding and knowing what the symptoms are and being able to look out for it because this person may not have written on their form or their doctors wouldn't have diagnosed them as being asthmatic. Okay? Um, typically it starts within the 10 to 15 minutes or so after beginning the exercise. There's some delay there from the start of the exercise because of the um, response time for the inflammation to kick in. Um, and then you, so what happens is when you're exercising, um, you're breathing, we had that increase, remember, in depth of breathing, and then maybe in rate of breathing, and that dehydrates and cools down the respiratory pathways a bit, and that triggers the inflammation response. And then when we get the inflammation response, we get bronchoconstriction. So it's um, worse in 
environments where you would be physically active where there are chemicals involved, so like swimming pools or ice skating rinks um, can be pr problematical. Um, it's much worse in cold weather, remember, hopefully you've read that information, we didn't have a chance to cover it in class, but remember that the cold weather doesn't hold moisture as well as warm air, and so there's less humidity and so the bronchial tubes get even more dry. So um, if you're going to exercise in the cold, it's often a good idea to wear a mask. <laughs> Like that's not very difficult right now, and uh, or you know maybe have a scarf with you so you can wrap a scarf around your face if you need to. Um, so preventative for this, you've got to be a little bit careful if you're working with uh, international or college athletes. Okay, um, you can get inhaled puffers that have corticosteroids in them. Um, they take about 10 minutes to kick in. But some of those steroids that are in those puffers are banned substances. So you've got to check the particular puffer you have against the banned list um, and make sure that, that you're not taking one or that you declare that you're taking it for asthma ahead of time. Um, some puffers have short-acting beta agonists in them instead, um, which act as a bronchodilator, but they don't have steroids. Um, so it just depends which one you're on. Uh, so it's important that you check. Non-pharmological, what can we do if we don't want to use a puffer, right? So warming up is really important, all right? using bursts of high intensity exercise. So, you know, do your regular warm up, but then maybe do some very short type sprints because that's important to um, encouraging bronchodilation, which we want to have, all right? And then it's important to cool down properly at the end um, and try to avoid allergens like chlorine in the swimming pool. So if you're a PE teacher or you're a mum that wants to take the kids to the pool, then you want to find out ahead of time what their timetable for adding chlorine to the pool is and try to time your visit so that you're um, not right when the chlorine is the most strong, right? So the ACSM have some um, good guidelines on how to work with people who have allergies or asthma. Um, if you check box 16.7 in this chapter, they also talk about exercise for children who have asthma. So there's plenty of information around. Um, it's really important, if you're the person in charge, right, it's important that you make sure that the individuals that you're working with understand they need to make, they need to have their meds with them, right? Even if they took it before they came, they should still bring it with them. Um, usually it's a good idea to take a puffer 10 to 15 minutes or so before you're going to start to exercise so it's got time to kick in and dilate the bronchial tubes. Um, the other recommendation they make is that you try to exercise indoors if the pollen count is very high. Um, so don't exercise outside in the morning. It always makes me laugh this because it depends where you live in the country, right? Um, you want to exercise in the morning in Alabama because at lunchtime it's ridiculously hot and humid and the humidity is lower in the morning but the pollen count is higher, right? So you have all these variables that you have to weigh up um, to enjoy your exercising.
Um, remember, or maybe you remember, that I mentioned a while back that we switch from breathing through our nose to breathing through our mouth when we've been exercising for a while. And they do recommend that you try to breathe through your nose as much as possible, but try it next time you're out exercising. It's actually quite difficult. Once your central nervous system has decided to switch you over to mouth breathing, it's pretty difficult to make yourself breathe through your nose. I've tried it a few times, just out of interest. It's quite hard. Um, don't exercise if you've got a chest infection or a cold and you're asthmatic, or if you don't have your asthma symptoms well under control. So, kind of sensible things really, but it's good, I think, that there's a, a definite list that the ACSM have, have got available. Um, also, there's an American Asthmatic Association I'm sure they have uh, tips and guidelines as well. Hopefully not a situation or a population who are at risk of um, dying on you while you're trying to help them be physically active. But if you have an asthma attack, they're quite scary even to watch, let alone go through. Um, and I think that, and they're very uncomfortable. So if someone has an asthma attack, it's going to put them off wanting to be physically active. And of course, what we want to do as much as possible is encourage people to be physically active. So I think it's, it's very important to pay attention to the guidelines and not Not, I mean, my, my partner has adult onset asthma, and I've seen him literally crash out of a racquetball competition because he had an asthma attack on the court. And, you know, it was hot, and I just think sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're competitive, and asthma isn't something that can kill you. It's easy to go, whatever, right? <laughs> I've got my puffer in my sports bag, I'll be fine. And it can really wreck the day, let's put it that way. Okay, so very important one, diabetes mellitus. Um, very important for many, many reasons, unfortunately. One is the chances of you getting through your career without working with someone who's diabetic are basically non-existent, um, even if you work with children, unfortunately. Um, the other reason that it's so important is that we have two types of diabetes. And the way that they respond to exercise is very, very different. And so just knowing that someone is diabetic isn't enough. You have to know which type of diabetes they suffer with, okay? So diabetes occurs when uh, an individual cannot maintain their blood glucose levels at a relatively stable level. Um, it's basically epidemic in Western societies now. Um, it costs the US a lot of money. These numbers are a little bit out of date, so goodness knows how much money it costs us now. Um, it is linked with overweight, obesity, lack of physical activity, all of which we're seeing happening. And once you have been diagnosed with diabetes, then that increases your risk for further diseases, such as um, cardiovascular disease, blindness, kidney disease, uh, gangrene, and losing a limb, and all, 
I mean, very unpleasant kind of uh, outcomes if you don't manage your diabetes carefully. So, um, about 60% of amputations that occur in the US, uh, lower limb amputations, so like foot or below the knee or even a toe, um, aren't caused by trauma, they're caused by diabetes. Right? So um, it's really important that we try to control the diabetes as much as we can. So what happens is the body can't take the carbohydrate, the glucose, out of the bloodstream and store it in muscle tissue and liver for later use. Right? So the circulating blood glucose levels increase to a level that's not healthy. Um, so type 1 is also called insulin dependent. It's the one that you're born with. Okay? It's only about 10 to 15 percent of the diabetic population are type 1. And what happens here is that something goes wrong um, with, the, with the development of the pancreas and it's not able, the beta cells within the pancreas aren't able to produce either any or at least enough insulin and secrete it into the bloodstream. And insulin is the transporter for glucose out of the bloodstream into the muscle tissue or the liver. So if there isn't enough transporter around, then the glucose levels in the bloodstream go up. Um, and so symptoms of type 1, uh, excess urine production, animals can be type 1 diabetic as well. Um, excess urine production, which you would notice as a parent if your kid is suddenly really thirsty all the time and going for a pee all the time. Sugar in the urine, you probably wouldn't pick up. It might smell a little bit sweet, but I think that one's, that's something that really needs testing. I'm not sure how you would know that. And elevated blood sugar, obviously. So the, the biggest symptoms are the being thirsty and going to the loo a lot. Um, so someone who is type 1 then isn't in control of that, it's not something they did, it's genetic, um, and they require uh, insulin, either injections um, or an insulin pump so that um, they've got insulin in their body to remove the blood sugar in, and store it into the muscles. So particularly around meals, a uh, type 1 diabetic has to learn to manage their insulin injection or their insulin pump um, so that the carbohydrate that they eat isn't, doesn't raise their blood sugar, that there's insulin available to move that carbohydrate out of the bloodstream. So they also have to be careful to plan their carbohydrate through the day so they don't have one big carbohydrate heavy type meal, right? It's, I've only known a couple of people who were type 1 diabetic, it's, it's a real palaver. I mean, you have to, it does take some planning. You kind of get into a habit, I guess, but it really does take some planning. You've got to be careful. Now here's where the fun begins, right, for us. What happens with type 1 diabetics and, and physical activity or exercise? So, for people with type 1, exercise might help their blood sugar control. It typically doesn't help. Um, so, it's not going to improve their diabetes, but we've still got all these other 
positive outcomes from being physically active, right? It still lowers their risk for coronary artery disease. And if they've not got too many complications and they've got good blood glucose control because they've got their insulin timed right and they know what they're doing and they don't have big heavy carb meals and then it can be very beneficial for other reasons, right? Um, you have to monitor them very carefully when they're exercising because um, when we exercise, the muscle membrane, right, the contraction of the muscles, particularly if I'm doing aerobic work, that repetitive contraction then increases the membrane's permeability to insulin and glucose. So they can get a sudden drop in blood glucose very, very quickly. So they might have to change the timing of their uh, insulin injection and or the dosage of insulin that they take. All right, so um, if they are doing like moderately, moderate intensity type aerobic work, then the recommendation is that you decrease your pre-exercise insulin and carbohydrate intake and monitor for up to three hours post-exercise in case they become hypoglycemic and they have to eat carbohydrate post-exercise. So there's all this kind of flapping around they've got to do but the exercise is important for their heart health and everything else. If they're doing high intensity anaerobic, like sprint work or really heavy type lifting, then they're likely to get hyperglycemic because of uh, glucose release from the liver. And post-exercise, they'll need a little bit of insulin to bring that hyperglycemia down and avoid carbs. So, see, the rules are really tricky. Like, it's, you can't just say, oh, after you've exercised, it's important that you have carbohydrate because you're a type 1 diabetic. Depends what the exercise was. So, it, you know, it's, I think it's quite an important, although this population you're less likely to come across, only 10%, but still, um, they're the ones who are more likely to get in trouble and end up in a diabetic coma and then you have to call an ambulance and it all gets very messy. Um, another thing to uh, pay attention to and to teach type 1 diabetics is to, pay, is to make sure that they understand about taking care of their feet while they're being physically active, that they have socks that fit and shoes that fit. Um, because they tend to get some neuropathy in their, in their feet and their lower limbs and then they've got decreased sensation in their feet. And so if their sock or their shoe is rubbing, you know, where you and I would be out for a walk and we'd be like, ow, I've got to take my shoes and socks off and pull my socks up and right, I'm getting a blister. They don't know they're getting a blister. Or often don't know they're getting not always obviously but often they don't and then um, that blister because their peripheral blood flow is impaired that blister can then get infected and turn gangrenous and that's how they lose uh, a foot or worse if they're not if they're not careful Um, oh, look, and here's all the stuff that I just said. So if they're doing moderate intensity endurance work, it acts like insulin on the muscle membrane, so then they can become hypoglycemic very quickly, and they need to reduce their insulin dosage and consume carbs before they exercise. If it's high intensity, then that increases glucose production, and they can become hyperglycemic, so they may need insulin post-exercise 
and no carbs. Right? So um, intermittent exercise, so this is this always is a bit frustrating. I hope that they do more research on intermittent type sports because soccer, basketball, racquetball, things like that may not need to pay attention to these other rules, but we don't have the research specifically on those. So I know if I if it was me, right, I would try to encourage this kind of carefulness um, because it's not that we don't know whether playing soccer or basketball or racquetball needs consideration around your insulin dose. It's that there's not any research on it, right? So. Questions about type one. So this might be skipping ahead, but does type two diabetes does, does exercise help type two diabetes? Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going. So, so that's the one of. The important things to understand is that for a type 1 diabetic, the exercise is unlikely to help their diabetes. But if they've got their diabetes under pretty good control, then it's going to benefit everything and it's going to make them stronger, it's going to improve their cardiovascular fitness, and, and it will help them maintain their weight and all the other side effects. Right? and the benefits of exercise they get. Um, and then as I said, the other thing to pay attention to is a type one diabetic, you need to have close control, right? You need to be watching that person all the time because they could crash at any minute if they've messed up their insulin. And if you're working with children, you know, they, they haven't learned yet what does and doesn't work, right? Or even teenagers may not know yet what does and doesn't work. You know, type 1 diabetes is typically identified, I think, by around the age of 10, 12. You know, so up until that point, they behave like any other child, and now all of a sudden they have to jab themselves with a needle several times a day, and, you know, they can't eat this food at this time, and. And so it's it's quite a big learning curve for them. So, so whenever a diabetic uh, crashes, do they just does that they just get like really weak and pass out? That say that again, love. Sorry, you went quiet. Oh, sorry. Um, so like if a diabetic has like an episode or like crashes or whatever, mm -hmm. exercise. What does that look like? Is that just, is that just them getting weak and passing out? Yeah, it can it can be. It can be something as relatively minor as, oh, my legs are going really wobbly, I feel dizzy. It can be completely fainting, passing out. It can go into a coma. So that's, you know, it's important to understand who is, you know, what's the difference? Is there someone in, in your gym or in your YMCA who's type 1 so that people know to watch for because imagine what would happen in a swimming pool right <laughs> you know if this person suddenly passes out in the pool and you have lifeguards that are on their phone texting their girlfriends like we do here <laughs> right and it takes a while for someone to realize that this person is not swimming anymore. You know, so it's, it's quite, it, it, it can be quite dangerous for type 1 diabetics, but the payoff, if they manage it properly, is so good with all the other benefits that they get. You know? Right. Okay, so type 2, then is 
also called non-insulin dependent. And it's a different kettle of fish. You're not born with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is mostly a lifestyle disease. Um, there is some underlying genetic, like if, it's, if it runs in the, fa if everybody in the family has type 2 diabetes, it's possible that there's some genetic um, disposition towards it, but still it involves lifestyle to develop, right? So what happens with type 2, your pancreas, your beta cells are making plenty of insulin. Right? They're doing their job just fine, unlike a type 1. What happens with type 2 is that the liver and the skeletal um, muscle, the membranes become less sensitive to insulin over time. And then because in, even though insulin is there, it can't carry the glucose through the membrane and so we see an increase in blood glucose levels. So somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of diabetics are type 2. So it's more, you're almost certainly going to come across people with type 2 diabetes during your career, less likely to, to have to manage a type 1, but it's possible, right? Um, it's considered an epidemic because of the increase in diagnosis over the last 20 to 30 years, which happens to correlate to the increase of overweight and obesity over the last 20 to 30 years. So we know that obesity, um, being sedentary, getting older, although unfortunately now we are seeing quite young children get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, um, the visceral fat, so what happens with overweight and obesity, when we talked about apple-shaped and pear-shaped, and we talked about the fact that men were at more risk because they tend to lay their fat down around their trunk and their organs, and women tend to lay their fat down more subcutaneously, it's not an absolute given, but it's the typical pattern. Um, so what they found is that visceral fat around your organs um, releases what they call a pro-inflammatory substance, and that destroys the beta cells in the liver. So you've got this whole mess, the obesity, <laughs> one of many um, problems that obesity can impact. Um, ethnicity is a problem. Um, native populations, African Americans, Hispanic, uh, are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes, but you can see it in any group. Now, are they more likely to develop it because of genetic disposition or because of lifestyle, right? I suspect it's lifestyle. Um, if you go back 50 years, Native Americans living on reservations didn't have type 2 diabetes. Right? They all did manual labor type work. Um, they reared horses. They grew their own food. You know, I mean, they were very physically active. And now we see a decline because their lifestyle has changed. We see a decline in their physical activity levels and now we're seeing more type 2 diabetes. So, as I said, it used to be called adult onset diabetes, but now there's a real increase in diagnosis in adolescents and, and even in children. So, yeah, it's, it's a big problem, big problem. So a reduction in insulin with obesity 
where are we here? Ooh. Let's hold on. Let me just go one more and see where we're going. Okay, let's do this last slide because it kind of builds on what we were just saying. So the adipose tissue, um, as I said, blunts the tissue's response to insulin. Um, and what's really fascinating is that, you know, if you're obese, there's a lot of fat mass there to lose. So if you can motivate this population to remember our seesaw, right, our energy balance, they don't have to change their whole lifestyle. Right? That's, that's a misunderstanding. If I can get them to just do a little bit more physical activity, Right? Go to the trail and walk one lap. Start there. Right? And eat just a little bit less. Not a big massive change, just a little bit. Right? Or replace an ingredient that you typically use that's very high in fat or saturated fats. Replace that ingredient with one that has unsaturated fat. Right? Little tiny changes. If they can lose 7% of their fat mass, then we see it up to a 50% improvement in insulin sensitivity. Now that was only one study, but wow! I mean, what an amazing opportunity to change your whole health outcome. Um, and then the next piece of information here is just that idea of um, changing the sensitivity of the muscle membrane by, by repetitive contraction. And so that really increases glucose uptake and that actually lasts for some time after the end of the exercise session. And so there's, there's lots of benefits to a type 2 diabetic to doing regular physical activity. Um, resistance training has also been shown to increase glucose uptake. I don't know if it does it as effectively as aerobic work. But, you know, if I'm a type 2 diabetic, I should be able to manage that type 2 diabetes through diet and physical activity without having to take insulin. That's, that's a big bonus, quite apart from the cost involved, right? Must be nice not to have to jab yourself with a needle every day um, just by making small changes in, in lifestyle. So, okay, I'm going to stop there, then we've got one more slide on type 2 diabetes so we can review quickly on Wednesday before we finish that off, and then we'll look at metabolic syndrome um, because that builds on type 2 diabetes and that's becoming a big problem. I want to look at uh, ADHD because particularly if you're going to work with children, unlikely to work throughout your career without having to deal with someone with ADHD. Um, the number of students over my 15 years here, you know, and I don't get told what's wrong with people, but I know enough of the symptoms that I can pick people out, you know, and, um, it's, it's quite noticeable how many more students have those kinds of issues now. So, um, questions? I'm, I'm all good. When did you sneak in there? 